Others will be coming in soon. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that we've got everybody here. Admiral Zukov, uh, we're getting started on another year. We're really grateful that you're here this morning to talk to us about what's going on with the Coast Guard. As you are aware, we're all aware that we don't have our have the budget out yet, but we are, uh, because we are in a, on a kind of a crammed up schedule to get things done on next year's budget, next year's appropriations bills, uh, we thought you cluing us in about the needs, we will be able to have a memory of that as we get, when we get our budget and we'll come back to it and talk about it. Um, the Coast Guard has a complex mission requiring significant resources including vessels, aircraft, and especially personnel. With responsibilities ranging from securing the nation's borders, safeguarding maritime commerce, and ensuring environmental stewardship, stewardship of U.S. ports and waterways, to interdicting drug trafficking and illegal immigration, and combating inter transnational crime, these challenges are diverse and require a force that is robust agile and well-equipped. <coughs> Excuse me. Congress provided substantial funding in FY17 omnibus appropriations to improve readiness, recapitalize vessels and aircraft, modernize shore facilities, and recruit and retain quality force. The committee is eager to hear from you on how you intend to sustain these efforts along with your priorities and concerns. I'm especially interested in your plans to recapitalize the Coast Guard's age, aging fleet and vessels and aircraft. <coughs> Excuse me. With the funding Congress provided in FY17, the Coast Guard now has four vessel modernization programs underway. The NSC and FRC programs are well established. I'd like to hear uh, the Coast Guard's plans for the polar icebreaker and the offshore patrol cutter as well as plans for addressing the remaining vessels in your fleet, many of which are past their useful life. In addition, in your recent State of the Coast Guard address, you stated a bigger force is needed. I look forward to hearing from you on what is driving the staffing requirements and a strategy to fund this growth, especially in light of the recapitalization efforts that the Coast Guard will need to continue to address in the future um, budget submissions. Although the FY18 budget isn't expected until next week, unmet needs will remain. The subcommittee will face tough decisions to ensure critical priority programs are adequately funded and that all funding appro uh, appropriated is, in fact, executable. Your testimony today will help guide this committee in making those tough decisions. After we receive your budget, I look forward to a candid discussion about unmet needs that were not addressed. Admiral, every agency is operating in const a constrained resource environment. However, I believe few can match the Coast Guard's consistently excellent performance. Recruiting and, and maintaining a quality force, sustaining operations with aging assets, recapitalizing for the future, and taking care of Coast Guard families. This is no easy task. I commend the leadership and the Coast Guard men and women who serve this nation so very ably. And I also want to take this opportunity to commend Commander Joanne Burdeon as she completes her assignment as the Coast Guard's liaison to the House of Representatives. I've dealt with many liaison officers from our military services as chairman of this subcommittee and a member of Deport, uh, the Defense Sub Appropriations Subcommittee. Again, I can tell you that Commander Bernion is one of the best. An ardent, responsible, and trustworthy advocate, she has been invaluable, an invaluable asset to the staff and the force multiplier for the Coast Guard. I and my staff will miss her and wish her well in her next assignment, where I know she will continue to serve the nation and the Coast Guard with distinction. Before I turn to the Admiral for his statement, uh, the text of which will be included in the record, I first want to recognize my, recognize my distinguished ranking member, Ms. Robel Allard, 
or any remarks you may wish to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Admiral, uh, to this morning's hearing. The Coast Guard has a critical set of missions that we must properly support. That is why I was pleased we were able to provide funding above the FY17 request for the Coast Guard, including $233 million above the request for the acquisition, construction, and improvements account, which funds the, the recapitalization of the Coast Guard air and marine assets, and $92 million above the request for operating expenses. As was mentioned, uh, we don't currently have any detail on what is included in the FY18 budget request for the Coast Guard. However, with this administration's focus on border security, we have seen in the skinny budget the other DHS programs uh, are cut. With the forthcoming 2018 request in mind, we need to know how the Coast Guard is operating and what resources are needed to support your important missions especially for personnel and operations. I also would like to thank Joanne Burdian for her hard work with the Appropriations Committee on behalf of the Coast Guard and the American people and wish her well on her next assignment. She will be with us for a little while longer, but this is probably our last opportunity to publicly recognize her service. Thank you again for joining us this morning, uh, Admiral, and I look forward to our discussion. And Admiral, before you begin, uh, I want to recognize your lovely wife here today with us. We, I've had the pleasure of being at your home and also traveling with you, and I know that she's the wind beneath your wings. So uh, we're very proud to have her here today. You may proceed. Good morning, Chairman Carter and Ranking Member uh, Foybel Allard. And uh, first of all, thank you for uh, for calling out the many accomplishments of Joanne Burdian. Uh, and uh, I will stay; she will leave. Um, <laughs> but we have many great coasties, and certainly uh, many that will be able to fill her place. Uh, I also want to thank the distinguished members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And especially, I thank you for your support of the United States Coast Guard. In particular, I appreciate your advocacy for the fiscal year 2017 consolidated appropriation as it funds key readiness and modernization initiatives and better positions us to address today's evolving challenges. I ask that my written, written statement be entered into the record. The Coast Guard is first and foremost an armed service that advances national security objectives in ways that no other armed service can. Uh, it begins with our authorities uh, that include over 60 bilateral agreements to enforce rule of law in the territorial seas and on the high seas around the world. And many foreign nations depend on the United States Coast Guard to be their maritime law enforcement against transnational criminal organizations. Uh, applying these authorities in 2016, we removed a record 201 metric tons of cocaine and we brought 585 smugglers. These are transnational criminals uh, to justice here in the United States where our prosecution rate is 100 percent. It's less than 10 percent in their nations of origin. And today, our greatest challenge in this campaign is really one of platforms and people. And we must maintain our current pace in recapitalizing the Coast Guard fleet while advancing shore-based unmanned aerial systems to enhance our surveillance capacity. So in 2016, we awarded a contract to complete the build-out of our fleet of 58 fast response cutters, all at an affordable price. And Bollinger Shipyards delivered the most recent four with zero discrepancies. And we awarded the acquisition of the first nine offshore patrol cutters to Eastern Shipbuilding Group, a down payment for a program of record of 25 of these very capable platforms that meet our requirements and, again, at an affordable price. And we are cutting steel today at Huntington Ingalls Shipyard on the ninth national security cutter. We've also stood up an, an integrated program office with the Navy and awarded industry studies to commence the build-out of a fleet of three heavy and three medium icebreakers, all meaningful steps to keep our nation on an accelerated path to deliver the first heavy icebreaker in 2023. 
And we also received our fourth consecutive clean financial audit opinion and have s minimized acquisition cost growth and timeline slippages. The Coast Guard is the only armed service that has been funded below the Budget Control Act floor in our annualized operations and maintenance appropriation. Going forward, we will need 5% annual growth in our operations and maintenance accounts and at least $2 billion for major acquisitions to operate and maintain our assets and preserve our acquisition programs. And I am working to rebuild our long overlooked inland fleet of 35 inland construction tenders with an average age of 52 years. Now is the critical time in sustaining our inland river system and overall maritime transportation system that contribute $4.5 trillion of commerce on an annual basis. This fleet is essential to our economic and our national security. And finally, we need to grow the Coast Guard. And with respect to our most critical asset, our people, over the next five years, we need to restore the 1,100 reserve billets that were taken out of circulation as we faced difficult budget priorities. And we need to bring on another 5,000 active duty members into our service over the next five years while sustaining are more than 8,500 civil servants. This is the direction that the world's best Coast Guard, our United States Coast Guard, must steer into the future. And so on that note, I sincerely thank the unwavering support of this subcommittee to address our most pressing needs. With the continued support of the administration and Congress, the Coast Guard will remain semper paratus, always ready. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Admiral. Uh, we are going to keep a time clock, but we're going to loosely keep the time clock. We're, we're here to get information today. Um, I want to start off with something you just mentioned that, that I've been looking at and thinking about. Uh, you state the recapitalization of the Coast Guard is the highest priority. Priority, however, many vessels that you operate have reached or surpassed their projected service life. The inland cutter fleet, in particular, which you just mentioned, this is so vital to the $4.5 trillion of economic activity that occur on our nation's waterways, and they are in desperate need of replacement. Only 10 of the 35 cutters are under 50 years old, and one that, what, that was commissioned in 1944. Uh, we don't even think of how old that is. The magnitude of this recapitalization modernization effort will require trade-offs annually uh, beyond the, the major programs like the NSC, the FRC, and the OPC, and the Polar Icebreaker. Does the Coast Guard have a viable plan to address the requirements of this vital uh, but aged fleet and what strategic risk are you taking as a consequence of focusing the recapitalization program on the NSC, FRC, and OPC and the icebreaker? Uh, Chairman, thank you for that question. And this is not a, a new need, a new requirement. Uh, this is one that has uh, lingered over time as we looked at other programs, other major acquisitions, and we did not want to put those acquisition programs at risk. Uh, but eventually you have to air out your dirty laundry. Um, and, and this is the time to do that. This provides full disclosure of what our on-met requirements are. Uh, as we build out the national security cutter, actually the ninth national security cutter will cost less than the sixth. Uh, as we look at keeping a hot product line going and then realizing economies of scale, uh, the cost of those are coming down. The fast response cutters are now coming out with zero discrepancies. So with mature product lines, uh, we are driving down costs and then holding requirements steady. Uh, we've already reached out to the Army Corps of Engineers and, and looking for a, a commercial off-the-shelf design for an inland tender uh, that can be modified depending on where it's going to be operating, but it would have the same engines, basically the same design, uh, and can be built for roughly about $25 million a copy um, in a commercial shipyard here in the United States which would also stimulate job growth as well. 
Uh, when you actually go down to the waterfront and you go on this, the Coast Guard Cutter Smilax, which is in fact 73 years old, um, the first thing you notice are there's no women assigned to it because these ships were not designed for mixed gender crews back in the 1940s. Um, we've done a lot of lead and asbestos mitigation to make sure that these are still safe to, you know, to, are habitable. And if they're not, we take them out of service. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is what maintains our infrastructure, our, our inland waterway system. And through the, that waterway that connects the deep water ports uh, are over $4.5 trillion of commerce each and every year. The heartland of the United States are maritime states in the true sense. Um, Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, Illinois, um, and so on down the upper Mississippi River, lower Mississippi River. Uh, when you look at the lattice work of waterways that we have and what, the, what burden that takes off our other highways, um, it, it really is what I would call geographic envy to any other nation that, that looks at our geography, um, but again, maintained by this fledgling fleet of 35 ships. Uh, the time to replace them have, have arrived. One other quick question. Uh, in your State of the Coast Guard address, you stated that emerging global threats warranted an increase in the NSC program from eight to nine ships. There's no question the national security cutter is a tremendous asset, performing well above expectations. It is, however, one of the many tools in the toolkit that the Coast Guard needs to successfully execute its complex <clears throat> and diverse missions. Funding a capital ship like the NSC is expensive. As you know, we will be faced with a budget decision to include production funding for a temp NSC uh, in the FY 2018 budget. Will adding more NSCs and reducing or foregoing other recapitalization efforts like the OPC, FRC, and inland cutters better serve the Coast Guard? Admiral, let me ask you today, as I will ask the Secretary next week, does the Coast Guard need more national security cutters to execute its 11 statutory missions? Will the 10th cutter endanger other priority recapitalization programs like the offshore patrol cutter, fast response cutter, or the polar ice breaker? Please be specific. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I've gone on record in the past uh, when we uh, laid out our program of record for, for eight national security cutters. Um, with, with our biggest concern being any additional growth, what risk that would impinge upon the build out of the offshore patrol cutter. Uh, what we received was top of line relief to build a ninth national security cutter with long lead time materials. In fact, that ship is under construction right now. Will we put that ship to use? Absolutely. In fact, today, one of our national security cutters, the Hamilton, uh, she's still in her first year of service, uh, will be returning to port with 17 metric tons of cocaine. In fact, there are 27 metric tons of cocaine on Coast Guard cutters today. So when we looked at what our requirements were for our entire fleet, our full program of record, we didn't have global refugee flows. Uh, we did not have trafficking activity. We weren't addressing the nine dash line and we weren't addressing uh, potential conflict with North Korea. So the world has changed at a much more accelerated pace uh, since we built out this program of record. Um, but I'll be specific. Uh, the offshore patrol cutter is our number one priority in recapitalizing our legacy fleet of today. Um, a 10th national security cutter, you know, if, if that is funded above the top line, will I put it to use? Absolutely. But we need to look at what the follow-on, the out-year costs are as well, not just the initial acquisition, but as I mentioned earlier, it's our annualized operating and maintenance funding. Uh, that needs to be built into this algorithm as well, not just acquisition, but the sustainment piece of that as well. And I agree with that. Uh, this will lead to a permanent end to live tissue training. 
Uh, can you tell me how the review uh, will proceed, what will be examined, if, and if experts from within or outside of the Coast Guard uh, will be used? Uh, um, ranking member, this will in, in all likelihood be a, a contract service, just as the, uh, the legacy uh, live tissue training was, and, and, and like you, uh, I, I found that quite honestly abhorrent um, in, in terms of meeting our mission requirements. Uh, so we will move to a, a simulation. Uh, it, it may be more expensive, um, but for us it will be the right thing to do to prepare our Coast Guard members who may be deployed to theaters where they, they may encounter uh, traumatic injuries. Okay. I, I believe there is some evidence, however, that, that it um – uh, it, it is cheaper to do it this way, so I'm, I'm hoping that that will be true. Yes, ma'am. And again, I, I look at this as the right thing to do. Thank you. Um, this past week, we saw the devastating uh, effects of a cyber attack involving uh, ransomware across many countries. And the news has reported that over 100,000 organizations have been affected in 150 countries. As vital physical infrastructure is increasingly dependent on the Internet, the potential damage of these attacks increases significantly. The Coast Guard is responsible for cybersecurity for one such piece of infrastructure, and that is you know, the ports. What would be the impact of such an attack to the movement of commerce, and what would be uh, a delay in operations mean to commerce if the ports were to shut down <coughs> even for an hour or a day? Uh, ranking member, I, this probably goes back to 2014 when there was a work delay um, on the West Coast as the uh, longshoremen workers were revisiting their contract renewal for five years. Uh, when I went out there, I flew over the ports of L.A. Long Beach and I counted over 70 fully laden container ships uh, anchored offshore because they could not engage in commerce. Uh, that immediately impacts the rust belt, uh, the manufacturing floors. Uh, it, it affects the stocking in major distributors. Uh, we live in a just-in-time environment. Uh, the daily cost is over a billion dollars a day, and, and then the jobs that get added on to that as well. This was a man-made disruption. Um, the very same thing can happen because about 90-plus percent uh, of our ports are, are fully automated. Um, they, they've taken the human out of the equation, if you will. So, so everything from cargo manifests to actually moving and then forwarding that container as well. Uh, so industry is turning to the Coast Guard in terms of what are the, you know, the, the national standards, if you will, for, for cyber security. Um, we are also, I am engaged personally with the International Maritime Organization as we just don't look at the United States, but we need to look at the entire international global supply chain. And then how do we codify and then share best practices internationally? And so we find the Coast Guard drawing more and more in, in terms of being, in terms of a sector, maritime, uh, to be, you know, the oversight, if you will. Not a regulatory, but, you know, disseminating best practices in terms of how can we prevent a cyber intrusion. Um, and then also turning to industry to report to us so that we know that there has been an intrusion in case this is a coordinated effort to disrupt our supply chain. Okay. And how is the coordination between the ports and, and the Coast Guard working with regards to cybersecurity? Uh, we have uh, 37 uh, area maritime security committees at, at all of our major ports, and within these committees, we have subcommittees uh, that are strictly addressing cybersecurity. Uh, right now, it is not built into the Maritime Transportation Security Act. Uh, that addresses fences and access, but it doesn't direct ind indirect access via the Internet. Um, so we're working, collaborating with the many port stakeholders through these air maritime security committees looking for best practices. Uh, I'm encouraged by what I've seen at Long Beach container terminals. Uh, they have nearly fully automated uh, that, uh, that port facility right down to autonomous vehicles that, that move containers, battery powered, no carbon footprint whatsoever. Um, but they built cybersecurity into the, into the forefront of that. And how do you migrate that best practice for others? There, there's a real cost involved in doing this. So I think the other piece of that is, you know, is the cost aspect. Uh, but a, the cost of a disruption um, would be ruinous to our economy. Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fleshman. Thank you. I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, let's remember to turn the mics on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Admiral, again, I want to thank you and the President. Um, I saw the Coast Guard graduation yesterday. I've had the privilege of nominating or trying to get some folks in the Coast Guard Academy. We have a proud tradition in Tennessee of Coast Guard uh, personnel. Specifically, uh, I did want to thank Master Chief Sean McMahon and the Wichita, they're doing wonderful work in Chattanooga. They're omnipresent, and uh, we thank you for them as well, sir. I've been uh, hearing lately that there's a potential shortage of Coast Guard Marine inspectors. With that in mind, would you briefly touch on uh, three things, sir? The importance, the important work that the Marine inspectors do to facilitate commerce, what a lack of Marine inspectors will mean to your inland waterway mission, and what has led to this problem, and what might our subcommittee do to combat it, sir? Um, well, I think the biggest... Uh, Congressman, the biggest challenge to our uh, Marine Inspection Program is Subchapter M, which now brings over 6,000 what had been uninspected towing vessels under an inspection regime. Uh, and this was brought on by just a spate of, of casualties. So. Um, where there are several alternatives that a, an operator may use. Uh, they may wish to have a Coast Guard inspector, or they may want to have a third party do the inspection on behalf of the Coast Guard. We call it a, an alternative compliance program. Um, I've come to the realization that, that, that we need to overhaul our alternative compliance program and provide more, more stringent oversight of these third parties doing inspection work on behalf of the Coast Guard. We've seen a number of casualties where third parties um, did not go to the level of detail that the United States Coast Guard would in, in finding safety, flagrant safety violations, um, and perhaps maybe that's why an operator uses a third party and not the Coast Guard, um, because we will write them up and make sure they fix it. So we need to provide ov better oversight um, and at the same time, we may incur you know, a larger share of this new fleet of ships uh, that will come under an inspection regime. Uh, the other part is we need to get after shipbuilding here in the United States as well. Uh, when we look at the status of our pre-positioned fleet, um, those that would provide sea lift during a campaign, many of these are 20, 25-year-old, they're steamships. In fact, there are very few licensed engineers that have steamship qualifications today. Um, and we only have about 78 pre-positioned ships, you know. And if you look back to World War II, the highest casualty rate was in our merchant marine. So if you think that there will be no casualties if we find ourselves in a campaign, a traditional conventional campaign, whether it's Europe, North Korea, or the like, uh, there are a lot of submarines out there that would take these ships out. So we need to be thinking about what is our ability to recapitalize our merchant marine fleet. Uh, and if we do, that requires marine inspectors as well. Um, we are on the, I would say, the fast lane to being a net export nation of fossil fuel. Yeah. And if there were a provision that would say a certain percentage of those ships have to be U.S. flagships, whether it's carrying LNG or U.S. crude, um, that might spark another increase in the shipbuilding industry. We have three Jones Act deep draft shipyards in the United States today. Certainly, they would be interested. This would, this would certainly stimulate economic development with jobs, but you know, I don't want to be the ones holding them up because I don't have enough marine inspectors. So whether it's on inspected towing vessels, national security, or international commerce, those are three areas that I see right now a growth, um, foreseeable growth requirement for our marine, marine inspection program. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, I will end by just inviting you next week, I'm sorry, next year is Coast Guard year in Chattanooga. We honor all five branches and we would like to invite you to Chattanooga on May the 4th. We've had the Commandant of the Marine Corps, we've had the CNO, 
uh, down. So I will extend that invitation to you as, as head of, of the great United States Coast Guard, sir. For May. I have the date. Thank you, Congressman. Yes, sir. Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I also saw the uh, graduation last night, and, and uh, yesterday afternoon, should I say, and uh, uh, very uh, good speech that you gave, so thank you so much. Um, I, I want to follow up um, on a couple of items that you mentioned. Uh, first, the offshore patrol cutter uh, project. Um, how's that coming? On, I mean, do you feel confident that it will be on, the production will be on schedule? Uh, any any particular things you see in, in the way, or will they be on, on schedule? Uh, Congressman, we are on target and tracking. And, and first of all, I have to thank this committee. Uh, as we awarded final design to award the contract back in September, uh, we did have to move some money around to make that happen. Uh, the 17 budget, uh, it puts the long lead time materials in place. Uh, I've been down to Eastern Shipbuilding Group, uh, and they are ready to cut steel uh, to put that first ship in the water in the year 2021. Uh, so I am very confident that they will deliver a top quality product on budget and on time. Okay. Uh, on a se second subject that you mentioned, uh, the icebreakers, I just uh, got back on a Codel to the Arctic Circle. Um, uh, Secretary Tillerson was there, and I asked him a question about the, uh, about the icebreakers, because as you know, uh, w when you have the Russians up there and other folks, you're talking about shipping lanes uh, that are important. Uh, then you're talking about the natural resources, oil, gas, uh, reserves that you have there. And I think the, um, I think the Russians have over 50 um, uh, icebreakers. I think that's what uh, one of the briefings told us there. And I think we have, what, two or three, one working, partially? We have two. Two. Uh, two. But the second, is the second one working? There's only one working, or they're both so working? The third one is actually deactivated. Deactivated. So there's two working built in the 70s? The, uh, the oldest was built in the 70s. The, the Healy is, uh, was built around the year 2000, so relatively new compared to the Polar Star. All right. So you mentioned the, um, the next one's coming uh, for us, 2023? Could you just ex expand a little bit on the icebreakers for, uh, for the Arctic uh, Circle? Yeah. So uh, thank you, Congressman. So we chartered a study uh, about five years ago to look at you know, what are the national requirements for access in the high latitudes. Uh, this was done through a third party, uh, and we went back, revisited a number of times, and, and at the end of it, the, the, the minimum requirement was three heavy and three medium icebreakers. Uh, if you use the, you know, a, a carrier, an aircraft carrier as, as kind of the model. And if you need an aircraft carrier, say, in the Pacific, uh, well, you really need three to keep one there permanently. Uh, one's in maintenance, one's, you know, ramping up to get ready, and the other one's deployed for six to eight months at a time. So it, it takes three to make one, uh, which is how we got to three and three if we need permanent presence north and south or, or even more so. Then we started looking at it. Now, now what's changed in the Arctic since the study was done? Uh, well, the ice has retreated at, at record rates. Um, about 13 percent of the world's oil reserves and about a third of the world's gas reserves are in the Arctic right now. And I say reserves because it's not profitable right now to do offshore drilling up there. But out of that, about half of this is in the U.S. EEZ and in our extended continental shelf. Um, and so we have sovereign interest at stake up there as well. Uh, we have seen China, for example, with their icebreaker doing annualized studies in what, what I would call our extended continental shelf. Put it in perspective, uh, that area is the size of the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. It's enormous. Um, but we have not ratified the law of the sea convention, so it is treated right now as the global commons. So at some point in the future, we ratify the law of the sea, we stake our claim. Uh, I would be naive to think that claim would not be challenged by others who claim they have operated there repeatedly, and this is now global commons, and next thing we know, we see a Chinese mobile offshore drilling unit going into this you know, extended continental shelf to extract what otherwise would be U.S. oil. Uh, we see Russia with their 40 right now, but they're still building their fleet out, um, prepared to deliver two ice-breaking corvettes that will carry cruise missiles in the year 2020. 
Uh, we have sat down with the Navy, um, and we created what's called the cooperative strategy for the 21st century. And we look at the Arctic, the Navy says, Coast Guard, you've got the Arctic. Um, so as we look at, you know, who has, you know, sole responsibility for exercising sovereignty in the Arctic region, it's the United States Coast Guard. So that gets us to a point of why we need national assets, icebreakers, um, to exert sovereignty there. Uh, and right now we're trying to do it with, with a ship that's 40 years old. It is literally on life support, uh, which is why we're going to accelerate the delivery of this first icebreaker. We'll need another one right behind that um, so we can deactivate that. We put a lot of maintenance money into this old ship, but it's the only heavy icebreaker in our nation's inventory today. My, my time's up, but I just want to say I appreciate the strategy because we don't pay a lot of attention to the Arctic. But once you get there and you get the briefings and you understand and you see what the Russians and the Chinese, I forgot the Chinese also, uh, and because of the reserves uh, that we have there and because of the shipping lane uh, and because of the military bases that the, uh, the, that the uh, Russians are doing there aggressively, uh, I think it's something that we need to start looking at. I appreciate your leadership on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Admiral, when David was chairman of this subcommittee, uh, we went to Alaska, what would that have been, in six or eight? Nine, probably nine or ten. Okay, nine or ten. My wife learned that Coast Guard needed an a icebreaker, and she's been bugging me about that icebreaker <laughs> ever since. And yesterday, when the president mentioned it in his speech at the graduation, she called me in the middle of another meeting to inform me that the president said he's going to give him an icebreaker. You've got the best lobbyist, as far as I'm concerned, in the, for, for me in this committee as anybody in the country. Mr. Palazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral, it's great to see you again. Really enjoyed seeing you in Pascagoula, Mississippi for the christening of the Kimball uh, this past March. And uh, look forward to several more christenings of the national security cutters. Um, and I uh, just want to thank you and your men and women that work for you for everything that they do, uh, protecting our maritime security as well as keeping the drugs off the streets and out of the hands of our children and our communities. That's an extremely important mission. Thank you for doing that. Um, my question is, $18 million has gone into research and development for uh, a shore-based long-range UAS. Can you tell me a little bit more about the program and uh, the timeline for delivery? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. So we've talked a lot about recapitalizing ships, um, which are long overdue. Um, but the reason we're having so much success right now in the transit zone is, one, you know, the intelligence is really good, and two, uh, the surveillance is good. Um, but we have not addressed what are we doing to keep pace with surveillance as we increase our presence on the water. Uh, and then how can you do that more effectively uh, and efficiently? And so. We're a little bit late to the game getting into the land-based unmanned aerial system. Within the Department of Homeland Security, within, the, within Customs and Border Protection, there's a squadron of, of nine Guardian UAVs um, built by General Atomics. Uh, we have Coast Guard members detailed to CBP um, to operate these, these remote systems, but they're really you know, land border focused. Uh, and so we really haven't addressed the, the maritime domain as well. And so with this 18 million, it's, it's really working within the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so we have a unified requirement uh, that, that we can leverage, uh, you know, what DOD is building. We're not putting Hellfire missiles on these. These are strictly surveillance platforms. But what can we, what are the state of the art systems in the maritime uh, that can look through cloud cover, um, that can work at extended ranges. Um, right now, the go-fast activity, I was at uh, Tampa, Florida, um, talking to our folks at Panama Express, and the go-fast now are, are heading south from Colombia, off the coast of Ecuador, um, out of range right now of our surveillance platforms that are pre-staged in Comalapa, El Salvador. Uh, so they are going beyond where we can reach. So we're now getting to a point we can't reach and touch them uh, until they come further north. Um, so they're, they're gaming our lack of surveillance capability. So the 18 million uh, gets after you know, the state-of-the-art sensor packages, um, the range that would be needed, 
uh, in the operating systems to operate these platforms at extended ranges, not from the United States, but really closer to where the threat is, miles and miles before those threats arrive in the United States, to stage those out of places um, in the Caribbean or perhaps in the Eastern Pacific uh, to address these threats that are ultimately destined for the United States. All right. Uh, thank you for that. You also mentioned earlier we discussed the Jones Act a little bit. Can you tell me a little what the Coast Guard's enforcement role is and perhaps why the Jones Act is extremely important to um, keeping the U.S. maritime industry strong? Well, well absolutely. And, and Congressman, I think as, as you well know, we, have, we only today, we have three Jones Act deep water ports in the United States, uh, Philadelphia Shipyard, uh, Halter Marine in Pascagoula, and then Nasco Shipyard in San Diego. Uh, if the Jones Act goes away, all U.S. flagships will be built overseas, and, and then those shipyards will shut down. Not only the shipyards shut down, um, the expertise goes with it as well. And, and so what if all those shipyards move to, say, South Korea? And now what if we find ourselves in a conflict in, in that region? And, and we are now dependent for an overseas shipyard in conflict to deliver ships for the United States. Uh, we didn't do that during World War II. I think we can learn a lot from history um, and, and not make what I would consider short-sighted uh, calculations that would have strategic consequences in, in the long run. Uh, obviously, with that comes our U.S. mariners as well. Uh, so for me, you know, it, it, it's job creation. Um, it's about national security, and it's a workforce that we need uh, to have at the ready if we do find ourselves in a global conflict. I look around the world today, and I'm not seeing tranquility break out anywhere. I'd like to see it somewhere, but it's just not breaking out. A lot of pressure on our military forces today uh, in terms of how do we balance diplomacy. If that fails, you know, what are the military consequences as a result of that? Jones Act is a big part of that. Admiral, thank you. Uh, I yield back. First thing, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I never realized how good the Coast Guard was until I came to Congress. I represent the Port of Baltimore. I know Judge Carter and I sit on the defense appropriations and we do the budget for Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And what you all do with what you have is just incredible, in my opinion. I think semper parat paratus, what does that mean? Always ready. Always ready. And if you look at what your missions are, but with drug interdiction, working with ports, uh, you know, doing uh, all the search and rescue, um, it's, just, it's just amazing. Um, when, you, when you're one of the last ones to ask questions, a lot of this has been addressed. But I want to prioritize on the area of uh, the Arctic again, and I, and I think it's really important that, that we deal with this because I think that we've maybe been so far away or whatever, but we have serious issues because, in my opinion, more than anything, is a Russian aggression. Anything having to do with Putin, we've got to be concerned. And now you also mentioned the China issue. And right now, I think Putin has 40 active polar icebreakers in the Arctic, um, while the United States has two, with the Polar Star being commissioned over 40 years. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of issues we have to deal with there. Recently, the Russians have made a number of aggressive moves uh, in the region, and that includes dispatching numerous military brigades, planning a large ship, uh, shipping port in Siberia's Yamal Pen uh, Pen Peninsula, and also rebuilding old air bases. Uh, U.S. presidents, and um, one of, I'm sure one of the issues, not only fr from a, a dominance point of view, but also because of the resources that are going to be there uh, as far as oil, uh, U.S. presence in the Arctic is necessary for more than just power projection. It's a matter of national security. Uh, it, if remain unchecked, the Russians will uh, extend their sphere of influence to over 5 million square miles of Arctic ice and water. Now, climate change is melting ice uh, in the Arctic at an alarming rate, and as a result, more waterways are becoming uh, navigable. Um, it, it is essential that the United States be ready to assist uh, any uptick in Arctic commerce, there is a, a vast amount of natural resources which we can extract, including large gas and oil reserves. And simply put, if our waterways are not cleared, we cannot capitalize on this resource. Now, in a GAO report, I read uh, that several years ago, the Coast Guard was unable to provide year-round access to the Arctic in 2011 and 2012, and the Coast Guard could not meet four of 11 total requests for icebreaking services. My question is, uh, first, how many medium and heavy polar cutters 
you need to completely manage increasing traffic in the Arctic? I got a couple yeah. more. Yeah, Congressman, you know, in, in the certain state of affairs right now, you know, the, the six icebreakers, three heavy and, and three medium icebreakers, uh, would satisfy those requirements. Um, you know, that is based on what the threat environment is in 2017. Uh, now, these ships will be in service for 30-plus years. Uh, as, as we build those, as we've seen with our program of record with the National Security Cutter, the Offshore Patrol Cutter, the world changes. And, and so what if the world does change? Uh, the advantage you have when you're building National Security Cutters, and now you're making these more affordable in the long run, you have a hot production line. Maybe at, you know, 10, 12 years from now, the world changes, but at least you're producing these um, at an affordable price, a predictable price, and on schedule, there may be a change. Um, but at least as we see the world right now, you know, the three heavy and three medium uh, would meet today's requirements based on the threats that we see. Including the Russian dominance there. With the Russian dominance. We need to look differently, though, at what an icebreaker does. Um, we need to reserve space, weight, and power uh, if we need to you know, strap on a cruise ship missile package on it. Well, that's an issue. That maybe intelligence, uh, utilities, those types of things. Right. But, let me ask you this. It, uh, I see Russia as a serious threat that we have to deal with. Um, so uh, in the current ice-breaking cap capabilities, would the Navy be able to conduct a full-scale defense of Alaska in the event of real threat to our homeland, based on what we've just talked about here with Russia? <laughs> I probably won't speculate on what the Navy, you know, can or cannot do. Uh, obviously, we have we the world's plan, plan best that, but Navy. But our cooperative strategy, uh, right now, we, you know, you don't see the Arctic addressed, you know, in our national military strategy as a strategic region. Um, so that's why, as I look at where the other services are operating, where are they not operating? Which is why I'm focused on the Arctic, which is why I'm focused on the Western Hemisphere. We're a military service. Uh, and so we need to double down where the other services are pulled off to North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, violent well, extremism. Many co countries, including Russia, lay claims to portions of the Arctic territory. If tensions rise, does the Coast Guard have the capability to firm firmly defend our geopolitical interests? Uh, Congressman, I would say it's seasonal. Uh, and for the Navy, it would be seasonal. Seasonal by virtue of the fact that our, our fleet of today, our offensive capability can only access those waters when they're ice-free. Um, and they're not always ice free. Well, it's something I think we really need to prioritize. I think it's really important. In this business of politics, it's important you listen to your wife. So I, I would suggest that this committee uh, and the chairman really listen to his wife and that we really make this a priority on where, where we're going. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Congressman, thank you. And, and again, I want to thank this committee because this is the committee that, that has really moved this, you know, from the starting block to down the track. Uh, the 150 million that we've moved out of the 17 appropriation that, that you put there uh, gets us out of the starting block. Okay. The other thing I want to say too, uh, if, if you are a female member of Congress, you need to listen to your husband. <laughs> I know I, I work out with him in gym sometimes. So I see. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. We'll go back. Uh, I definitely I listen, um, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Admiral. Thank you for being here today. Really appreciate it. Uh, everything that you guys do in your service, and I know that Coast Guard is a great bang for the buck, if you will, and uh, and and certainly, in my opinion, a fundamental part of our national security apparatus. And uh, I really appreciate what you do. A couple quick things. Actually, I just want to just follow up one one thing on that, uh, that Representative Ruffelsberger just said about defending sovereignty in, in the Arctic. Um, I know that he he did ask in terms of the Coast Guard's capability to do so in in the face of. Russian movements, Russian aggression, and stuff like that. Um, can you just re repeat that, if you will? Do you believe that the Coast Guard currently has the capability to be able to deal with that potential threat? And if, uh, and also, is there is there a strategy in place now that um, connects you with the Navy to be able to do it if you need more backup, if you will? I'll first talk about the strategy, and, and I'll go back to our cooperative strategy for the 21st century, which is signed by the CNO, myself, and then the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And so what it does is it looks at what your inventory is of assets, and, and then it looks at where you employ those. And so when you start looking at the Arctic on the surface, you know, that is where you'll find the Coast Guard. Uh, are, are we ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Russian combatant with a national security cutter? Um, our, our capabilities on the national security cutter are, are more defensive than they are offensive. So as currently equipped, 
um, you know, that platform is not ready to engage um, in, in what I would call traditional naval warfare. Um, the Navy certainly has a, a fairly robust so submarine fleet, and so if nothing else, that would keep an adversary guessing. Uh, and our Navy has operated in the Arctic for, for some period of time. So in terms of an offensive capability, it would be less surface and it would be more subsurface. Um, but how might this play out? I mean, do we immediately jump, you know, to armed conflict, or does it begin with the fact that Russia has already claimed most of the Arctic, you know, up to and including the North Pole? Um, and now they start extracting resources. Or they move fishing vessels in there, and we say, well, wait a minute, that's not yours. Um, and so initially, the conflict or the tensions, as we see in the nine dash line in the East South China Sea, uh, it, it doesn't quite approach armed conflict. It's something less than, uh, but if you don't have an ability to exert sovereignty, uh, then they're going to fill that vacuum. So I think that presence piece um, is not presence, but it's really posturing to say, hey, this is our sovereign interest, keep out. Um, and, and so I think that is really the strategic way forward. Gotcha. So we look at international law first, maritime law first, and go that route, and then but backed up with a pre with a presence. Yes, sir. The um, if I can switch gears just really quickly on on the cyber, uh, have have you guys have you seen an increase in in attacks? And is there currently? Uh, and I've asked this question at a couple other hearings as well too. Are, are there currently uh, data sharing on attacks? Uh, to be able to establish a pattern or potential a attribution to state sponsors potentially or, or others, um, and then also for, for best practices. So, again, are, are there are you seeing an uptick in attacks? Is there a sharing apparatus between agencies and, and even military services to be able to, to find patterns? Yes, sir. Uh, I would say the, uh, the, the pattern is persistent. Um, you know, we operate on the uh, Department of Defense Information Network, and in fact, the, the J-6 uh, for the Joint Chiefs of Staff is a Coast Guard three-star admiral. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs brought this individual in and says, well, we military just operate on the .mil domain. The Coast Guard operates the full spectrum, .gov, .com, .mil, and so we really need to bring a Coast Guard three-star, who we created, um, to fill this position because we can't just insulate ourselves within the dot mill domain. Uh, we also help staff uh, the Department of Homeland Security's NCIC, which does the interagency inter piece, and the 17 budget actually finally provides us uh, the building to establish a program of record uh, because up until now we've been a volunteer fire department in cyber. Um, pulling people off of other primary jobs to do cyber work. So now we can finally build out a program of record, uh, the professionals who will be doing cyber full time. Two graduates, two brand new ensigns that graduated yesterday, uh, they're going straight into cyber. Um, we have a shortage of about 209,000 cyber professionals in the United States today. So to think we can bring these in off the street, we're gonna have to grow it our own. So th there's a human capital piece that goes with this as well. And I don't want to thank this committee for allowing us to go from a volunteer fire department to a professional service when it comes to cyber. I got more, but I'm, I'm a, I won't hold all the time. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral. I don't let me welcome you back to the uh, Department of Defense. And thank you for. Sorry. Realizing we don't have the figures for the uh, for the coming year has to do with Hurricane Matthew, which, as you know, had a devastating effect on uh, on our region. Uh, and I know several Coast Guard units uh, along the East Coast, from Florida to Virginia, were damaged in in the hurricane. Coast Guard had estimated operational impact uh, and impact on the crews who have to work. Uh, to work on, on uh, overtime to be uh, something like $92 million. That was the estimate. Uh, Congress did not appropriate funds for Coast Guard recovery in the December emergency supplemental, but we did provide $15 million to begin repairs on facilities in the April omnibus bill. So can you provide us a, um, a status update on the East Coast unit's uh, recovery? And is it fair to say there still is $77 million worth of need today? 
Uh, Congressman, yeah, we still have a, a seven, $77 million hole. The $15 million um, from Station Tybee, uh, which is right outside of Savannah, Georgia, Cape Canaveral, uh, Ponce Inlet, uh, those were probably the most seriously impacted um, units from Hurricane Matthew. Uh, their, their piers were destroyed. Um, right now, a lot of these units are operating out of portable trailers. In fact, the that's where the 77 million, the brick and mortar to reconstitute those stations uh, would go to. But what the 15 million does do is it at least allows us to sustain operations as on June 1st, we start a whole nother hurricane season all over again. Uh, and then we also enter into what I would consider our peak search and rescue period as well. So the 15 million, it at least keeps us in business. Um, but not in the ideal state, but as good Coasties, uh, we will be Semper Paratus. I'm sure that's true. Uh, I also infer from what you said that this, um, this uh, cost estimate remains valid as, as to what is still yes, sir. required. Let me move to an important question of, uh, of border security, very much in our discussion and debate uh, these days. Um, President's asked for additional resources to construct a physical wall along the uh, southern border, as you as you well know. It seems to be a well kept secret that uh, Congress um, built 375, 370 miles of pedestrian fencing in the uh, 07, 09 fiscal year period, and the 300 additional miles of vehicular fencing that that's uh, that's in place today. And I remember Coast Guard briefings from uh, the period when that fencing was going online about the impact of migrants and smugglers who um, were increasingly prone to come to the U.S. by sea when their land routes were, uh, were, were cut off or were in impeded. So I wonder what kind of data you actually have from those earlier years on the uh, correlation between enhanced physical construction on the land border and waterborne uh, <coughs> migrant uh, traffic numbers. Have you made any projections about what the operational impact on the Coast Guard would be of, uh, of this proposed border wall? Uh, thank you, Congressman. And I would, if we're looking at a, a defense and an offense, uh, a, a wall is certainly a defensive approach. It's, it's a goal line defense. I'm the offensive coach. So uh, what does the offensive coach do is when it comes to uh, illicit goods, human trafficking, and most, this is moving almost predominantly by sea eventually working its way up to the southwest border. Um, I, I met with President Santos in Bogota two months ago to address the significant increase in coca cultivation, cocaine production, all destined for the United States. It takes to the sea. Um, we have these authorities, and that's the one place where this commodity is vulnerable is on the water. When it lands in Central America, the corruption, rule of law, uh, it has really taken over, and in fact, it facilitates the movement of this commodity rather than in bulk, you know, 80, 90-pound bales of cocaine, now you're talking grams, uh, that try to ride along the legitimate trade between the United States and Mexico, uh, and that is secreted into the United States. So once it touches land, I almost view that as a, you know, as, as a disease. Uh, what it does to law enforcement, what it does to elected officials. If we can stop it at sea, we give those communities, that security environment, a better opportunity to get a grip on some of this violent crime that is taking place. So the offensive coach says you, you need more offensive play downrange. You've got all the authorities to go right into their waters and, and apprehend them, you know, regardless of where they're at. All these countries want to see them extradited, almost without exception, here to the United States to prosecute. And before they're prosecuted, they will turn evidence and provide us valuable information on where the next load is coming. So it feeds that whole intelligence cycle. So the offensive game is a pretty sound investment. Um, I'm, I'm not the defensive coach, so I can't really speculate on you know, what it takes to stand up that goal line defense in the form of a wall. But it will be... Uh your your defensive capacity in terms of the small craft coming into this country, which um, uh, of course uh, could conceivably um, increase if the land routes are uh, are further restricted, that um, that defensive capacity will be uh, will be required. You're exercising it right now. Is there any any projections about that or any um, 
comments about how it worked last time. Yeah, so thank you, Congressman. So, yeah, we looked at, you know, that defensive approach, if you will, we saw with Cuba. Um, this time last year, I had between eight and ten ships, you know, in the Florida Straits because we saw last year a record movement of Cuban migrants. Uh, we have now gone seven weeks without one Cuban migrant apprehended at sea or even attempting to flee. Um, but we realize, you know, it, as you allude to, uh, it, it's the squeeze the balloon effect. Uh, if you apply pressure, as in a wall, then, you know, illicit activity will find the path of least resistance, and that path is the water, which means we would have to draw down assets to apply that defensive measure if we saw a change from land to maritime access to our homeland. Do I have any time remaining? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. I will move just quickly to this uh, Cuban matter because that was going to be my next question, if uh, if time time permitted. Uh, I, you've you've cited the statistics already. The uh, the uh, interdiction numbers are down and actually at zero. Is that what you said? I, that's what I understand as well. At sea, Congressman, yes, at zero. Sea. That's what I mean. So. Um, what, what does that mean in terms of uh, the deployment of uh, Coast Guard resources? That, that, that offers, of course, a possibility to focus on other areas, other problems. Um, what, um, what, are, what are your projections there? So with the, what changed in the Florida Straits was the repeal of the wet foot, dry foot policy. That's right. Um, and so we've been able to move some of those ships uh, deeper into the Caribbean. Uh, and, and so now we're seeing... Shipments of cocaine that have been leaving Venezuela, the Guajira Peninsula in Colombia, destined for either Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, from there they go to Puerto Rico as well. And so we've seen an uptick in our at-sea interdictions because we've been able to push those ships, those resources, fewer, fewer of them in the Florida Straits to now look at some of the, these other threats. So. Uh, I would call it a target-rich environment. Um, so if it's, if it's not migrants, the, uh, the, there's plenty to do with all the other illicit activity uh, in the Caribbean, also in the Eastern Pacific. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, I want to go back to the, uh, the icebreaker for a minute. Uh, as we've talked about, the U.S. Navy and the Coast Guard established this joint program <coughs> office to manage in the acquisition of this asset. And the bulk of the funding so far has been with uh, defense appropriations. However, Defense Committee, in their report, uh, accompanying language in the FY17 omnibus, encouraged the Coast Guard to budget for the all follow-up requirements. Uh, the money that we got from the defense was the planning money. Uh, can you tell this committee about the procurement funding strategy this program in 18 and beyond, uh, do, do you envision that we have to chin these billion dollar ships ourselves? Are we going to still be getting shared costs with the big budget of the defense? Uh, Chairman, that's a great question. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time talking to Sean Stackley, and as we look at building this first heavy icebreaker. Uh, he's all on board, you know, in standing up this integrated program office for the first. Um, and we've also been looking at driving the cost of this first one down to get that cost figure under a billion dollars. We haven't built one of these ships in, in 40 years. There will be a front-end investment. Uh, but I, I cannot go at risk. And if the Navy's got a re you know, if they're going to a 355-ship Navy, um, they've got to recapitalize the Ohio-class submarines. Uh, you know, where does, where does the Coast Guard equities play into there? Um, and, and so that's a risk I'm not willing to take in the out years, and I will look to see, you know, we're going to have to work very hard uh, to make sure that we don't lose this appropriation. Uh, we certainly have the capability, the capacity within our acquisition program to see this program through. Uh, and, and in fact, I could not be more proud of our acquisition staff who have held requirement steady, growth steady, on-time deliveries with zero discrepancy ships being delivered to our service. Um, but the funding piece is a huge concern going forward. When I look at the pressure that's going to be placed on the Navy uh, with their recapitalization aspirations, uh, this is a program we would be in a much safer place if, if we had the appropriation in a Coast Guard budget versus DOD. 
but you understand we're talking about a, a roughly $40 billion uh, budget here versus a $600 billion budget there. And a uh, billion dollars for us is means a lot of things have to go wanting in other areas of Homeland Security. Uh, I'm all, as you, as you well know, I talk to you publicly and privately, I'm all in for the icebreaker program. I definitely want this first icebreaker to be an example, and I don't dispute your three and three uh, idea. But as I look down the tunnel of time, uh, these are big ticket items, as big a ticket item as we would have in the Homeland Security budget. We don't know where we're going to be with this administration. We may get beefed up because we are obviously part of where this president has a vision. Um, but uh, let's, be, let's be practical. This is a big ticket item. So I'm hoping the Navy won't bail out on us. And I didn't like that language when I saw it. You probably didn't like it either. No, sir. <coughs> uh, and back to another subject we've talked about extensively, but I know it's back on the table. The medium icebreaker idea that there's this uh, commercial ship that has been, been offered as a possible lease alternative on a medium icebreaker, yet we, I don't think we've been able to, to see what this, this ship can actually do. It's a, it was designed as a service vehicle for offshore platforms uh, and to bust heights to get there, I assume. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, is multiple. I'm going to throw a couple of them out at you and see what you think. A, can it break ice in the Arctic? In the Antarctic, do we know? Do we not know? Can it perform law enforcement missions, i.e. boarding operations, being operated by a commercial crew? Uh, can it require, what it, would, what it require major reconfigurations to make it an active uh, part of our fleet? And could leasing this service help mitigate the risk of icebreaker acquisition in the Arctic strategy? These are things I would, what I'm sure you've looked at. Uh, what do you think? Um, thank you, Chairman. So uh, over a year ago, I sent a team of engineers down to look at this particular vessel. Uh, they provided me a report, and so then I went down, and actually I went out to Seattle to see this ship as well. Uh, and among other things, first of all, it has never completed ice trials. I mean, on paper, it's an icebreaker, but it hasn't demonstrated its ability to break ice of what we would require a medium icebreaker to do. Uh, it's not configured to launch and recover boats to do law enforcement missions. It's not configured to hangar a helicopter. It's not equipped to do what I would consider sensitive communications at a classified level to do maritime domain awareness. And you do that with a civilian crew, but perhaps it can be done. But there are a num number of conditions that would need to be satisfied before we can entertain this. So we are in a dialogue with, with this vendor of, of here's what it would take. No one's put a price tag on the table. Um, and, and I don't know what that price tag is. And I would not absentmindedly, um, you know, make a, a promissory to engage in, in this lease option, if you will, and then pressurize this committee um, to not only raise money to recapitalize a fleet, but now I've got perhaps an exorbitant lease rate on a platform that may at best marginally meet our requirements. And so I need to be a responsible steward in that regard. So we will continue to have a dialogue with this vendor and, and ideally get to a point where, you know, we need to talk price here uh, and not conceptually. Mr. Perry? Could you yield for just a second? Yes, I, I would think I yield. We need to, to look forward with, with all of the other issues you're talking about because that could be uh, – when you're talking about oil reserves and gas reserves between Russia and China, that could be a really dangerous spot. And I think we need to be prepared and not just put money in. Well, we've got to be – we've got to have something like the Zoom walk. Do you know what I'm talking about, that new ship that we just – uh, I've been on that one too. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you for the other. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Rufusberger. And, uh, you know, so basically – we're, we're still where we were when we had this conversation the last time. We're still looking at it. There's, a, there's an avenue of conversation going on, but the positions are still the same as 
per that report, which I read uh, the previous time you looked at it, we're pretty well in the same place. Uh, yes, Jeremy, we've, we've been in this business for over 70 years. Um, we know what it takes to operate in, in this very remote, harsh environment. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a unique design uh, for a single purpose. Uh, and, and so we are, are more than willing to sit down with this vendor and have a back and forth. But until we actually start getting into the specifics and, and, and what are some of the costing algorithms involved, um, I am not ready to move forward until I have all of that information in front of me. Um, and it would be a breach of trust on my part for me to then turn to you, sir, and say, I'm, I'm going to need this lift to, to lease something. I'm not even sure if it's going to meet our requirements. I assumed we were still in the same place, but I had to ask because I knew there still was a conversation going on. We are, sir. The, does anybody want to do a second round? Or? Okay, well, go ahead. Ms. Hill. Well, first of all, I, I just want a little bit of clarification in, in your response to uh, Mr. Uh, Price's question uh, with regards to the impact of building uh, a, a wall. Um, is my understanding then there is the unintended consequences actually that, that then the, there will be increased migration and um, drug trafficking on the seas. And, and is, in, is, is the Coast Guard doing anything in anticipation um, that that might happen, especially with the limited funding that you have? Uh, Ranking member, we haven't seen that happen yet, but probably no better insight than when I've met with uh, each of the presidents of the tri-border region of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Uh, when you look at the economies, they're not doing well. When you look at the violent crime, not doing well. A lot of parents are actually pulling their children out of school because they're afraid they'll be uh, co-opted by a gang. Um, and, and so what's going to happen to this next generation? And so what they're telling me is that their only hope is to get out of their country. Um, and, and they'll do whatever means it takes. And if a wall stands in their way at some point in time, they'll find a way to go around the wall. Um, and so we have not seen that yet, but that would be a foreseeable consequence if you have an impenetrable barrier on the land border, then you go where there isn't a wall. And, and in all likelihood, that would mean take to the sea. Um, in the FY17 bill, uh, we were able to provide a small amount of funding, uh, $10 million, for projects on the Coast Guard's unfunded priority list. And I imagine this list will likely grow to increase comp competition for funding created by the push for increased uh, border security. Do you expect the unfunded priority list uh, to grow in FY 2018 and in future years? Uh, yeah, thank you, Ranking Member. So we're doing tri triage on what I would call our, our shore infrastructure. Um, and so when I laid out a, a way ahead and we talk about a, a $2 billion floor, if you will, for our major acquisitions, $300 million of that would be allocated to our shore infrastructure. What it does, it, it provides us a more deliberative approach on our major acquisitions uh, to, to eat at the $1.5 billion shore infrastructure backlog that we have right now and do it in a deliberative way uh, to a point in time where we don't have to look at an, an unfunded priority list and, and triage what our needs are one year to the next. Um, but in, in the meantime, we do owe this committee our unfunded priority list for 2018. Our folks are hard at it. We've got our 17 appropriation. Um, and, and working that through our department, through OMB, um, I, I'm putting the pressure on our folks is we need to get that to you on time because you have done tremendous lifting um, to work at those unfunded priorities. And again, I thank you for doing that. So, so the list will be provided to us? Yes, ma'am. Oh, once you get the budget, okay, because it, it's important. Obviously, we're not going to have all the money to, to be able to address all, all your needs, but I think it's important for us to know what those needs are and how you're prioritizing. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Robel Allard. One more, just oh, one more question, sorry. okay, uh, because I, I was greatly disturbed to hear about the recent Marine Corps uh, photo sharing scandal in which the members of the Marine uni uh, Marines United Group posted explicit pictures of female Marines without their consent. What is even more uh, egregious is that according to news reports, this group was discovered by regular rank and file Marines, not specialized uh, investigators. 
What does the Coast Guard do to monitor social media for abusive behavior like this? So we sent a, a team of investigators. So we you know, worked with with all the other armed services when, when this scandal came out. Um, relieved to see that we don't have a, a Coast Guard website of Coast Guard United. Uh, and in fact, there were very minimal involvement of victims, if you will, in this Marines United website. Uh, it, it's a challenge um, just because of the proliferation of the websites that are out there. Uh, but we do have policies in place. Um, th this is harassment in the workplace. This is bullying. Uh, and so there are measures in place to hold people accountable. Uh, I know the Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, is looking at standards of accountability. And you know, this is a subculture. It's, it's inconsistent with everything that all the armed services stand for. But there is this subculture. Uh, do, do you have investigators that act, uh, actively look for this type of behavior? Uh, we are right now. So as, as part of this task force that was stood up, uh, we went out and we, we scanned the websites. Uh, and you have to get creative, you know, and, and looking, you know, for search engines and trying to find this. And some of the, are they on the dark Internet? But we have not s seen any surface. I'll just, you know, the other aspect of this subculture, uh, you know, I put a communique out to the entire workforce uh, that we're a service of, of by doers. You know, not, you know, we always talk about bystander, but you do something when you see something wrong. Uh, we've seen tremendous progress in the reduction of sexual assault in the United States Coast Guard. It, it was my imperative to try to drive this out of our service altogether, but our numbers are down 40% uh, over the last year. Uh, not only that, but more and more members are coming forward with unrestricted reports, uh, which tells me they know that leadership takes this serious. We're going to hold those accountable uh, that think that they can live a double standard, uh, but not in my Coast Guard. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harris. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry I wasn't Turn your mic on. I think it might be, it's not close. It's red. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Admiral, for being here. Uh, today. A couple of questions. Um, uh, first of all, just one observation. Uh, I, I hope that uh, we pay particular attention to the, to the Bahamas and, you know, the, that international trafficking that might occur from the Bahamas because of their policies, you know, on visas. It's, it's, it seems like it would be a pretty easy entry route for some people uh, uh, to enter the United States uh, who aren't here for good, good means. Anyway, let me a uh, ask about uh, Compliance with uh, one of the some of the executive orders the president has issued, uh, uh, Executive Order One Three Seven Seven Three, enforcing federal law with respect to transnational criminal organizations and uh, preventing international trafficking. Uh, in your testimony, you talk about the interception of uh, and and again, this is the president's prioritization of saying, look, we're actually going to get tough with people who, who attempt to do this. Uh, but you say that you know 588 smugglers were detained, but only 156 were referred for prosecution. Uh, you know, we heard, uh, uh, I believe it was in this subcommittee, from uh, the Border Patrol under the last administration, uh, you know, you had to carry a significant amount of drugs with you before you were prosecuted, which is just striking to me. I mean, we should have zero tolerance. This is, these, are, these are drugs. These are harmful. These kill Americans. And uh, so I'm curious, if you, if you detained 588 smugglers, why only 156 referred for prosecution? Uh, Dr. Alfta, get back to you on that 156 number because we're looking at nearly 100 percent prosecution well, well, but, rates. But this is in your written testimony. I, I don't understand. This is not, you know, 588 smugglers, 580 detained. Pro this, I and maybe you, maybe some of your staff can assist you with this. Who wrote this for you? Didn't that strike them as pretty unusual? You detained 588 people with drugs, I assume, or some illegal contraband. And you only, you only prosecute 150. I mean, that bothers me tremendously. As someone who wants to protect the youth in my district from illegal substances that the last administration turned their back on, creating a horrendous, horrific ep epidemic in this country. I appreciate you getting back to me on it. Okay. Uh, let me, as I said earlier, I was in Tampa, Florida on Monday. Um, we have a, pro we take these, mem these detainees there. Uh, referred to the U.S. Attorney, 100 percent prosecution. Many of them are providing information. So there are a lot of folks in the pipeline. Uh, 
may, maybe, maybe, well, this says referred for prosecution. It doesn't say prosecuted. N now look, I, I, don't know, I don't understand whether you're being honest with me or not. You have plain English in your, in your testimony. It says referred for prosecution. It doesn't say in a pipeline. Yeah, we will get back to you on that, sir. Because I, I hope that under this administration, our border security has zero tolerance. And, Admiral, you are part of our border security. Well, I'm a zero tolerance kind of guy, doctor. But I, I hope so. I hope so. All right. With regard to the uh, immigration enforcement, we have obviously another executive order, 13767, border security and immigration enforcement improvements appear to be kind of directed toward the southern border, but I assume that, uh, that the Coast Guard looked at the executive order and said, yeah, there are actually things that we can improve in turn, uh, under this uh, order. And again, um, to reverse the striking, the strikingly, I don't, I don't even know how, how you would phrase it, uh, the catch and release policies of the last administration, the, the, the willingness to turn their back on defending our border. So I'd like to know what the Coast Guard is, is, is doing with regards to that particular executive order, uh, the enforcement improvements for our border security. Uh, well, Doctor, before this executive order, we had more than doubled our Coast Guard presence in the transit zone, Ill illicit drugs. We, we removed a record amount of cocaine last year, and we'll probably beat that record again this year. So we have repositioned where we have forces. Now we do that, I don't have more ships than I had the year before. I've taken them out of other areas to double down here. In fact, we're the only, yeah, we don't see other aspects of our military operating this domain. So I've taken that upon myself. Uh, we have not seen any Cuban migrants uh, since a wet foot, dry foot policy went into effect um, in January. We have, in the last seven weeks, not one Cuban migrant. The threat vector you alluded to, the Bahamas. Um, so some of those ships that were between Florida and Cuba, we're now looking at the threat coming from the Bahamas. Most of what we're seeing is what I would call human smuggling, um, Brazilians, Venezuelans. Uh, we're not seeing those special interest aliens that may be coming to the United States to cause us harm, but we're looking at that threat as well. We have uh, joint task forces created under the Department of Homeland Security. We have Coast Guard, CBP, Homeland Security Investigations, working hand in glove to look at, most of this is focused almost exclusively on illegal migration, um, but to work not just on the members, but what is the network that are moving these people as well. No, thank you, and, uh, and I appreciate that, because you know there are only two ways to get into this country illegally. You either come by land or by sea. And, uh, you know, you have a huge role in the by sea. And with regards to getting back to me on the first question, I understand that you can only catch. Obviously, a prosecutor has to agree to prosecute. Uh, and, and that's what I want to know. I want to know if, if what's, what, what, what we heard at our southern border was that the, that the prosecutors were unwilling to prosecute uh, low-level drug crimes uh, when they involved uh, violating our borders to deliver drugs here to kill our people. That's what they do. Drugs kill our people. Uh, so I understand, it, that, but you are the one who, who, who's best able to say, look, uh, we, we, we find these people. Somebody downstream isn't doing what they need to do. So I'm depending on you to let me know what's going on there. Yeah. Thank you. So again, there may be a technicality. Um, so these were cases uh, versus individuals. So typical smuggling package is four to five people. And, and that goes into a case package. Okay. And, and so we, we may be... Uh, I, I think in violent agreement, perhaps, uh, but I need to validate, okay, who are in these cases? What are the numbers of people? Uh, but typically, it's, it's four to five and a go fast, and they typically plead out, um, and again, prosecution rate pretty darn high. Good, and, that, and that's what I need to go after, because again, what we heard from the southern border is that the prosecution rate wasn't high. And I hope, it, because I think you, the, the, when you uh, uh, seize contraband, I think it's probably higher quantities. I mean, people, you know, don't put one little cube on, a cube of marijuana on a boat. Uh, but if you can get back to, back to me, I appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. Yes, sir. Mr. Coyar. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just follow up on my colleague. Um, 
This is an issue I've been looking at because uh, I do live on the border, um, and I assume this applies to any of the U.S. attorneys. Uh, brought this to the attention of Chairman Wolf some time ago because what you have is every U.S. attorney district will have a different policy. You, just like Border Patrol, you do your job. You, you get them. You present them over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. The U.S. Attorneys, because Congress, and that means, if I can just correct the, my colleague, it's not the past administration. It's the past administrations uh, with an S. And this could, could continue if we don't add money into the legal system. The problem is Congress always puts money into Border Patrol, the law enforcement, and you create activity because you arrest people, you put them down in the legal system. But if we don't add the U.S. attorneys, uh, judges, and if you look at the caseload for the judges on the border, they're about this high compared to other judges that have a level caseload this high. So if we don't add judges, U.S. attorneys, U.S. marshals, and everybody down the stream, then what they're going to continue doing is they're going to continue prioritizing the cases. And I know that because I get frustrated in my area because without revealing the amount of, uh, of uh, drugs where they either say we're not going to prosecute or we're going to give it to the local district attorney and the local district attorney say hey we're, we're already loaded up here then it, what happens is I joke around that if you're a bad guy all you have to do is X amount just be a pound under and you might be let go because or, or sent to the state level because of the priority so it's all a matter of funding and if we just keep putting money on the goal line, uh, then all we're going to have is we're going to have the same problem, past administrations with an S and current administration, unless we seriously put money on judges. Uh, I'm talking about the border, the, the, the judges, uh, the U.S. attorneys, uh, the U.S. marshals, and everybody down the system, we're going to be in the same thing and still be talking about this for a while. So it's, in my opinion, it's not your fault. Uh, it's a matter of putting money into the legal system, number one. You also mentioned that um, the wall is a defense and you do an offense on the water. I respectfully disagree. I think if you look at the $18 billion that we spend on land and ocean, that's a one-yard line, the goal line. And if you want to play football, I'd rather play defense not on the one-yard line, but I'd rather play uh, defense on the their 20-yard line, which means that, like you mentioned, work with Central America, work with the Colombians, you know, the president's here this week, as you know, a Colombian president, and that's what we need to do, expand, extend our, ex, uh, our perimeter instead of playing on, on defense. So we appreciate your efforts on that last part. Uh, the last thing I want you to consider, and I uh, got some language into the law some years ago, and, and the Coast Guard did a report, is the only international waterway that you all don't really spend time on is the Rio Grande. And I understand it's not, it's what they call, uh, remember the last Coast Guard, it's brown waters compared to blue waters. And you prefer blue waters, I understand that. And I understand it's not deep, uh, but you got those airboats uh, that are available there. Uh, I know the Air Marine is doing some work there. But uh, just want to just mention, for the record, the only international uh, river that you all don't do any work on, really spend, uh, is, the in, is the Rio Grande. Just, and it's an international waters, as you know, and because it's an international river. Uh, so I, I do want to say I, I appreciate your work. I look forward to working with you on the uh, icebreakers. Uh, I did, uh, when I mentioned the Secretary Tillis, he said he was going to talk to uh, Tillerson. He was going to talk to the President. So if he mentioned it at the speech, I guess he did do that. Or maybe listen to uh, somebody's wife. I don't know what. Uh, but either way, uh, I want to be supportive of the committee on the icebreakers because we just can't forget about the Arctic. Uh, I do appreciate the, the work that you do, and, and sometimes your hands are tied. And, and Mr. Harris, I'd be happy to work with you because I've been looking at this for a long time. And it's frustrating. It really is frustrating that law enforcement, and I include you also in, in the work, you present it over the U.S. attorneys. They don't have the resources, and therefore they make priorities, and I don't like those priorities on that. But unfortunately, if we don't put the money, we're going to be talking about this for this administration, other administration. But I appreciate the work that you all do. Yeah. Uh, Congress, just on, on that note, where we prosecute these drug cases, uh, I have taken out of Hyde 
uh, a number of our JAG officers as special assistants to the U.S. Attorney so we can move these cases forward. Um, and I'll continue to make that investment to take some of that burden so these do not become low-priority cases, and, and so we do get the prosecution as well. Yeah. And, and finally, Mr. Chairman, keep in mind Miami Vice, and I keep, uh, you know, in, in the 1980s, if you remember, the drugs were coming in through the southern, I mean, that area of the United States. Some of us in Texas were saying, you know, one of these days it's like a balloon. If you put the pressure here, they're going to come another way. Sure enough, years later, here we are talking about the border. And, and as you know, when you talk about billions of dollars of drugs coming in, there we have consumption in the U.S., and the bad guys are going to, transnational groups are going to be making money. They're going to find a way. If you block over here, they're going to come another way, and it's a constant, ever-going, you know, strategy that we got to have. It's not static. It's ongoing. And, again, you all play a very important role. Yeah, and uh, kind of just adjacent to your district, uh, you know, down in South Padre Island, um, huge influx of illegal poaching by Mexican fishing vessels, fishing in U.S. waters. Uh, and a lot of these fish are protected, red snapper, for example. So uh, a lot of effort being expended by the Coast Guard to stem this back weekly. Um, we're in, you know, seizing uh, these pangas, uh, but they just keep coming and coming. If you're down in uh, Port Isabel, you'll see a, a yard filled with hundreds of these boats that we're seizing. So right now, that's been a pressure point for us uh, on our border uh, as it approaches the Rio Grande. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Cuellar has done a, a lot of really hard work, and, and I've also twisted Mr. Culberson's arm. We are getting more legal resources into this project. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Admiral, real quick, can we speak about um, the Anti-Terrorism Force, MSRT, I think it is? Can you just talk, talk to us about, you know, and let me preface this by saying uh, I was very impressed by the, by the coordination and collaboration down on the, on the border, um, specifically in the San Diego area, of course, with the Coast Guard and, and CPV and, um, and how that, just, just using each other's strengths and weaknesses and le leveraging those, I thought it was awesome. Um, on, on the Anti-Terrorism Force, uh, MSRT, is that something that you see that is essential for the Coast Guard mission? Um, is, it, is it absolutely needed? Uh, if so, is it, uh, what are the capabilities currently? Do you need more funding for it? You know, what, what, can you just talk a little bit about that, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Congressman. And as you would well appreciate, uh, you know, these are actually counterterrorism, not anti-terrorism. Counterterrorism. Um, uh, two teams, uh, one in San Diego, one in Chesapeake, uh, each team about 200 people strong. Uh, I was just at SOCOM and met with General Thomas uh, on Monday as well, and uh, as you know, SOCOM is lead for, you know, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, you know, they are the go-to team. Uh, the Coast Guard has uh, over nearly a dozen bilateral agreements. It covers every flag state of convenience. Uh, we have a national targeting center in Reston, Virginia. We work with CBP, Coast Guard, so we screen every ship over 300 gross tons on an international voyage. The cargo, the cargo manifest, where was it packed, who are the people. And so if there's an anomaly, as they well, wait a minute, you know, there could be a weapon of mass destruction. We don't know 100 percent, but there might be one in this container. Uh, we have the authority to board that ship anywhere on the high seas. Uh, and if they are not compliant, then we have agreements with uh, uh, third Fleet to provide vertical lift. So we come in with, with a team. Uh, we fast rope in. Uh, we take positive control of that ship. We stop it. Um, and then we go ahead and we do the search. Um, we can do everything but what special forces can't do. I can't say that in an unclassified environment. But it gives us that authority in an ambiguous threat to stop it before a ship, say, enters the port of San Diego, a military port. And now we've got a commercial ship with a we weapon of mass destruction on it. So, so we still see a requirement for us to have it, either that or we assume away there will be no proliferation of nuclear material, you know, forever to come. And when I look at Pakistan, I look at North Korea, uh, I'm not ready to make that assumption. So, so we need to sustain this capability. This is not your everyday coasties. Um, open to both genders, but a as you can appreciate, what it takes to get folks through that level of competency, um, from, from weapons to agility, the muscle memory that's required to do these jobs, uh, these are a, a one-of-a-kind. We have two of them in, in the United States Coast Guard, in the Department of Homeland Security, for that matter, as well. 
just a quick question, quick follow up on that, and certainly not diminishing, diminishing any capabilities or at the level of what they do. And I think it's awesome. Um, you know, I know that in San Diego specifically, where where the Navy will utilize the Coast Guard and they'll work collaboratively to use some of the law enforcement powers to be aboard ships, as you very well know. Again, is that something? Is that something? The that SOCOM can be a, a part of again, or and also, what is the budget for the for the uh, counterterrorism forces currently for on both sides? Yeah, so we have both of those in budget. Well, I'll get back to you on what that exact number sure. is, um, but at the same time, you know, I have uh, advanced interdiction teams from these elements uh, that are currently filling a niche over in uh, you know in CENTCOM's AOR. Uh, that takes a burden off our soft community, our Navy SEALs, as they're looking at doing other things. So. So we do get those requests for forces, uh, for a capability, and, and these are teams, we call them advanced interdiction teams, that can provide these platforms serving off Navy ships. Uh, then what it provides, you know, nav sent is the ability of saying, okay, these aren't just Title 10, we could also do Title 14 law enforcement because we have this unique team that can switch hit Title 10 and Title 14. Excellent. Uh, switching gears really quickly, thank you, thank you, Admiral. Um, uh, we've, t we've heard about moder modernizing the fleet Coast Guard cutters and might acquire additional mile pier length beyond your current fleet needs or, uh, and that you're potentially looking to cluster your assets and optimize more shore maintenance activities. Any chance of uh, potentially home porting those fleets in the Tidewater area? Uh, Tidewater's been a great home for us. Uh, it's a great home for our people, too. Uh, I mean, they always say it's a Navy port. Uh, well, it's a Coast Guard port, too, as well. Uh, so as we look at building out our fleet of offshore patrol cutters, uh, we'll probably have to extend our pier lengths that we have at, at our base in Portsmouth. Uh, we'll probably have to do some dredging. But when we look at just not the infrastructure, but we also look at the communities, um, the health care, the schools, um, and the fact that you can do multiple assignments in the same geographic region, and our people like being there. They stay in the Coast Guard. So, so Tidewater uh, has always been friendly to the Coast Guard. Uh, and you can count on seeing white ships with red s racing stripes in the Tidewater region for the indefinite future. Excellent. Well, thanks for your service. Thanks for your testimony today. Thanks for all of your service over there. We appreciate you and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, we, we thank you for being here. We went a little long, uh, but the reality is uh, you guys are kind of the darling of our, of our uh, world that we live in in this, this subcommittee and we're glad to be able to have a conversation with you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for the great work you do. Thank all of the Coasties for us. They're models for America. We uh, appreciate you. Chairman, thank you, ranking member, all the members, and I, I especially want to thank those sitting on the, on the back seats over there, just like the people sitting behind me. Uh, a lot of this work doesn't happen without the support of our staff, so again, thank you very much. Yes, sir.